Hey guys, this is Man to Man Podcast, a podcast about all kinds of basketball. I'm one of your hosts, Jacob Rosenfarb. I am Jeff Griffith, your other host. And I am the producer, Josh Daklas. A um, lot going on in the sport of basketball. College is back, and I'm thrilled. We'll get to that. <laughs> but um, plenty to talk about in the NBA. Definitely. And I think the, there are a lot of question marks, a handful of things that, you know, we're through a 10-11 game sample size. There's, you know, there's not enough to really make any judgments. Sure. But there's still enough to say, like, okay... You start to see some trends unfold. The big one, I think, a team that we expected to be very good, um, currently middling at four and five and twelfth in the West, is the Houston Rockets. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've they lost four straight at one point. They've since won three straight, um, but had single digit wins over the Nets and Bulls. So that's not too impressive. No. Um, but I mean, what do you see their biggest weaknesses right now? Um, is, I it, mean, is it Carmelo? <laughs> yeah. It's it's easy to point the finger at Carmelo. I don't sure. think it's I don't think it's quite that simple. I think they lost a lot of depth this offseason. We yeah. knew about that going mm-hmm. in. I think that's a huge problem for them. And and I, you worry about a, a mm-hmm. roster as as veteran heavy as this about mm-hmm. some some early season sort of turmoil. These t- these players might yeah. Chris Paul is notorious for working himself into shape and, and if James Harden has kind of taken after that, it's it's not surprising at all that that they are finding some early season struggles. Well, those two have been the leading scorer in pretty much every... One of those two has been the leading scorer in yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. much every game this year. And like I said to you before before you hit record, the one time since the season opener... So Eric Gordon led him in the season opener. The one time since then that it hasn't been Harden or, Car- or, or Chris Paul, it's been, it was Carmelo Anthony leading them with 24 points in a 20-point loss to the Clippers, which is their worst loss of the season. Do you see any correlation there? I mean, or, there has to be, at some point, there has to be some correlation, right? The like, one time they don't lead you in scoring, and it's Carmelo leading you, you get blasted by a middling Clippers team. It just, I That's mean, a bad just, sign. It's just the reality of adding another player in that locker room who who thinks they're the best one there, who yeah. requires X-level shots and, you know, X-level touches. Yeah. And, and you just, said he's taken 12 shots a game, and compared to compared to what last year? I mean, he essentially took Luke Richard, Mabah, Mute, and, like, Ryan Anderson's spot. Like, he, right. he was somewhere, like, he's a hybrid of those two, essentially, and... And neither of those two commanded the ball at the same level Carmelo does, or or thought of themselves as highly as Carmelo does. Yeah, the two of them combined averaged twelve shots a game. Yeah, exactly. And that's you know with that, that when you have those guys who aren't supposed to be your main options playing like they're not supposed to be your main options, it allows your Hardens and Chris Pauls to control the game the way you want them to. Yeah. How much do you think they miss uh, the shot of Trevor Ariza? Oh, I have the uh, uh, substantially. Like he's he he's would, been solid in Phoenix. He's been really solid mm-hmm. in Phoenix. I mean, this is he, he. We knew he was going out to get his money this off season, and yeah. props to him. But wow, he yeah. com- his absence completely rejiggers the uh, the face of the Houston Rockets. Their whole identity. I mean, they are they are seriously lacking mm-hmm. in that wing stopper. I mean, we saw yeah, it he their, was that guy you could dish to and shoot. Bingo. He was a guy was he's a guy who was most most importantly happy to stand in the corner yep. and and just let it launch. Yep. Um, and that's perfect for what they are. Exactly. And you're not getting that with Carmelo. And and so I mean that's the reason they were yeah, so. Who aggressive. is that this year? I mean, so they they hoped it would be James Ennis. I I still think uh, that's a big that's drop off. Up I in, think. It's up in the air whether that's a reality. PJ Tucker is fine at that role, but like. He has serious shortcomings in other aspects of his game. So yeah, there's I mean, James Ennis is shooting forty or forty three percent from three, but he's only taking five a game. No, he's only getting twenty two minutes. Like, did, like Trevor yeah, Ariza was was a was a lock in their starting lineup, and they clearly haven't found that five man unit that really works for them this year. Uh, so yeah, so I'm worried. Mm-hmm. I, I have some serious concerns about this Rockets team because in yeah. the in the West, like as cutthroat as it is, like. I just uh, think a couple what, games here and there really really hurts you going down. Right. What made them so good at last year was that inside inside out kind of offense predicated on you know getting open shooters the ball sure. with guards who could distribute. Yeah. And when you don't have when you lose one guy who like you said is perfectly content to just post up and shoot, and then you replace him with Carmelo who has to have the ball in his hands, wants to create for himself. You lose that element of your offense. Exactly, you lose you lose what made your offense so special, and that's a huge blow for this Rockets team yeah. that that you know has serious championship aspirations. Yep. But we saw them be super aggressive in the Jimmy Butler sweet. Yeah, tell that, me more about that. Is that realistic? Oh, for sure. I are mean, they are they biting on that four first rounders trade? I mean, I at some <laughs> I feel point, like that kind of trickled away. How I've heard have about the that Timberwolves one. not jumped on that? Like, it's, it's I don't know. Strange. Okay. How did so the Rockets offer a, that? As because a, they they see their clear championship window. Their moment is now to grab a championship, and when there's a player of Jimmy Butler's caliber available, you do anything to go get him. And sure. I, I respect that, but but yeah, just it's weird to me that the Timberwolves haven't traded them yet. Yeah, can one of you guys answer just how the Timberwolves have not jumped at that yet? Because from a non 
like every day back like I feel like you guys are in basketball every single day I'm in it not every single day um and I just looking from the outside looking in I would say it looked how could you not accept that trade I feel like that's one of those you know we all you know we look at it with this this very like outsider view of like yeah take it but like there's probably a part of the Timberwolves front office that isn't ready to admit that they're not going to win yet. That's my best guess. I think there's there's one guy in the Timberwolves front office who's not ready to admit they're not going to win yet, and that's Tom Thibodeau. Yeah, exactly. He, he did not come to Minnesota for a rebuilding. Exactly. Process. I think that's the problem. They're not they're not ready to admit that they're not winning with Take, this roster. I, I it's not even. I think it's an admitting thing. It's a just a and a, so, and blow it up and start over. They're not ready exactly. to make those make those steps to start over. Exactly. They're not ready to have that commitment towards a a kind of not a brutal yeah. rebuild, but like like if, if they're trading Jimmy Butler, they should probably also trade Wiggins and build yes. around Cat. Uh huh. And that's the reality. And I don't think Thibodeau wants that at all. I mm-hmm. and I understandably, that's not why he came to Minnesota. He came to Minnesota to put the Timberwolves in championship contention every year. And like on paper, it makes sense. They should be they should be in the conversation, but clearly clearly something's gone awry. The the weirdest part to me is that. The Timberwolves are kind of just letting Jimmy Butler like screw with them how he wants. Like you know, yeah. oh, I'll it's take incredible. I'll take myself out when I want to. I will I will play the game he's, with. He's with, LeBroning them. He's coaching the team. He's, he's coaching his role. I should say he's coaching his role. But it's like, but it goes beyond that. It's yeah. a it's like a, a he's taken the the entire franchise. They're like and, his puppet. They really are. And it's just <laughs> it's weird incredible to me. I don't know why they aren't either benching him or trading him or suspending him or something like. Yeah. Clearly, this is a negative presence on your team that is not helping you win. Mm-hmm. And you like already it's clear your guys aren't. Yeah. In championship caliber yet, so like it's time to. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what you're, they're doing now. Let's let's get back to the Rockets real quick because I th- I think we pretty much know where the Timberwolves are this year. They're uh, you know they're a decently talented team that's probably not going to do anything, um, largely because of you know in house issues that we've talked about. But the the Rockets we still think should have a shot with Butler. Do you worry about them? I guess. Having too many go-to guys on the floor at once. I I think that's kind of an oxymoron to a certain extent. I don't think sure. you can have too many go-to guys. You know what I mean, though? Because like, yeah, too many guys who want the ball in their hands. Yeah. maybe I, that I can get behind. But like when when the when the conference finals start rolling around, the playoffs start rolling around, and defenses get tougher, and and it becomes much more difficult to score points. You want as many guys on your team who can take their guy one on one off the dribble right, and absolutely. get a bucket. And Jimmy Butler does that for mm-hmm. you. So assuming they get him. They're still Western Conference contenders. I I would put them as I right now. I mean, I don't want to overreact to an early early rough stretch, but uh-huh. like they might have dropped in that second tier. Seeing how good this Warriors team, like, like that five to eight tier, kind not not even that five. To, like to me, they're right now in the West. We are yeah, just we, be Warriors, and then like the second yeah, tier of playoffs. We were team. looking at it earlier in the season as Warriors, and then Rockets, exactly. and then everybody. Exactly. Now you're saying they're kind of just in it that middle. Might, but if they get Jimmy, they they're I back think they to probably that clear two. Elevate themselves to that clear two as a serious legit. Chance of, of taking down the Warriors. I sure. think I I really do believe that a a, tr- a a quartet of Chris Paul, James Harden, Jimmy Butler, and Clint Capella is is really freaking <laughs> screw Carmelo. Yeah, well, I mean that, that that four spot is is interchangeable. They could go James Ennis, they could go PJ Tucker, but regardless, that is a I think that that is a legit shot at taking down the Warriors. Sure, absolutely. Now, if they don't get Butler, if they what's don't, your, what's your ceiling? If they don't get Butler, they have some serious questions they need to answer. Like mm-hmm. if one, if that fourth person steps up, that 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 wing that they need steps up, whether that's Ennis, whether that's Carmelo, sort of rejiggering his thoughts on where he yeah. stands on this team, or or somebody else, some midseason midseason acquisition, some buyout that really that really helps, and whatever it is, it's they need something. They need that one uh, that next piece on the wing to really elevate their overall status. Yeah. Now. Are we pretty much convinced by the end of this season somebody's getting Jimmy Butler? Man, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not convinced because I feel like I'll believe it when I see it. Exactly. You know? Like if, if they haven't traded him now, what is going to be their their reason to trade him later? Like yeah. they're they're not. It's not like they're going to be worse. Like they're they're not. I, they have to see the writing on the wall that they're not a serious playoff contender. I mean, they they're four and eight right now and thirteenth in the West. Like there's never been a better time to trade him. They're not doing it now. There might be some reason. That, I, I mean, he's going into free agency next year, so we know for a fact he's not going to be on the team uh, come come twenty nineteen. So get something. For so him. get something. Of course, I don't get know. four firsts for him. <laughs> I, I really don't understand it. I mean, because it's it's weird. Their owner Glenn Taylor is like all on board the Jimmy Butler trade. Like he is, he has been on it since he paid, since Butler came out and said he wanted a trade, which mm-hmm. makes sense. Um, 
So it, it's that's weird. gotta be frustrating if you're him. It's weird to see the owner kind of bowing down to the coach in this yeah. in this moment. I mean, like, it's it, it's if it's Popovich or somebody like that makes sense. But this is Thibodeau. Like th- he's, th- not, th- he's good, but he's like yeah. you don't. He doesn't run the team no, for a reason. No, no exactly. Yeah, I mean, they, they gave him a, a a fair amount of power when they hired him. Like sure. that was a huge part right. of him coming out of retirement to, of to take this job. But like at some point, you're the owner and you have to put your foot down. This is what you really want of. Train Butler, you have to do it and need exactly. I think we both agree. I would have to think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's a it's a crap show in in Minnesota right now. I don't know yeah. what they're doing, but uh, but yeah, the the Rockets could really help a could really be helped with an addition of Jimmy Butler's caliber. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, kind of switching gears a little bit to a, a team we're used to seeing be good in the Eastern Conference, and they have been absolutely disgusting. Is the Cleveland Cavaliers? Yeah. Oh my goodness! Just for a little reference, Cleveland is one in ten, currently in line for the number one pick, if I'm not mistaken. And they, I mean, their losses have looked as ugly as their city edition jerseys, which we'll get into <laughs> it. Awful, first of all. But um, at least I think so. Any any dissenting opinions? I don't. Uh, I I in my mind they're okay. They're not the worst though. I think that honor might be saved for Milwaukee. But um, those were rough. Yeah, yeah, those are real bad. I feel like I feel like a lot of teams. City jerseys this year are way worse than last year's. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for Just, it. But... Especially Dallas. Yeah. I yeah, loved Dallas, last year's. Dallas is rough. Uh-huh. Dallas is not ideal. I really liked last year's. But <laughs> yeah, back there to any reason why they changed it up this year, other than just to make money. Probably to make money. Uh, yeah. To look, it, to look cool. I, I mean, think their idea is we'll we'll change it up every year and we'll we'll get we'll get that bread from that. Um, I don't. I don't care. I'm not, I don't hate these. I'm not gonna lie. I don't hate these cats. I do. Really? Yeah. Those aren't that okay. They're. They're not. They're not Milwaukee bad. Compared to the bad ones that we've seen this year, they're not that bad. Compared to the ones we saw last year, yeah, I'd say that's that's. I'm wild. giving them a solid three and a half. Wow, that's brutal. That's but last year's were like a five, in my opinion. Really, I like this year's more than last year's. If I'm really, honest. yeah, I like I like last year's. I like yeah, I like this year's more than last year. Huh. I think last year they went with a very simple kind of gray concept, and that's that's solid. But uh, I thought it was clean. It, it, I, I just cool. think this year's it's looks solid. weird. Like those colors together. It's an it's an it's an, it's an interesting. Also, combo why those for colors? Sure. Um, I mean that's a harken back to their to their like early '90s time, like that okay. Mark Price, Ron Harper, sure, yeah, Brad yeah. Daughtry, mm-hmm. Daughtry sort of era. Um, um, I kind of like it. But let's get back to the to the hardwood. <laughs> so, Cleveland's only win is a twenty point home win over the Hawks. Nice. So impressive. the Hawks are bad, but <laughs> you, know, you killed them. That's good. They've since that game lost to the Nuggets. Nuggets are good. We'll get into that later. They got blown out by thirty in Charlotte. Lost to Orlando, lost to Oklahoma City, but they've taken double digit losses to some of the worst teams in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, Atlanta, Brooklyn, um, nothing but respect. They lost. I mean, they lost in Minnesota. That's not too bad, but like, they're one in ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you doing if you're Cleveland? Clearly, clearly nothing. Like clearly Tanking. they are. Yeah, clearly they're working for. They're they're dying for Zion. Now, does this tell you more about the Cavs or LeBron? Oh, interesting. I get honestly LeBron because this is um, this is basically the same exact team he dragged to the finals last year. <laughs> dragged is a perfect word. It's kind of ridiculous. Like, I, if you really look at this roster, they haven't made a lot of changes since yeah. last off season. And it's you when you see that roster without LeBron. Like when you see it with LeBron, everybody else seems to look fine. Like you know, like Rodney Hoods of the world seem to look, oh they look good because they're with LeBron. It's like yeah. you know, you think of them in a different light. Now you see that that roster by itself. And everybody just looks like a like a ragtag bunch of like nobodies. It's it's honestly embarrassing. It's so it's so. You decrepit. have to feel bad for Kevin Love. You have to feel bad for Kevin Love. Well, Kevin yeah. Love is injured, and just I would those checks. not be surprised if he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna sit this one out. I'll see y'all in 2019. I for what though? Him. Like, what are they gonna have that's better next year? Colin Sexton, Zion Williamson, and and Kevin Love. That's and, their trio. And. They're going to get two of those picks. Two top five picks. That's Zion. Hmm? You said... Com- oh, okay. I thought you said Cam Radish. Colin Sexton ah, is this I year's. Swear you, I swear you said Cam Radish. <laughs> Hold, yeah. Oh my god, imagine if they got Cam Radish and Zion. That'd be pretty cool. To go with Colin Sexton. <laughs> that's a good team. <laughs> that is a good team. Yeah. <laughs> Darkest thing, when you, la- when you land two top five picks, your, your team definitely... In, in one of the top heaviest <laughs> drafts we've seen in a long time. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's so much so much dysfunction going on in Cleveland. I mean, they were the Ty Lu gone after six, seven. Yeah, games. we never really talked about that. I mean, it was it was embarrassing for the for the program as a whole for yeah. for all of Cleveland. I, I don't I don't get that. Like, I feel like you know maybe we're just I I'm, I'm idealizing um, from like an from like a big picture perspective, but I feel like you have to know that team struggles aren't 
Ty Lue's fault. Yeah, okay. Right? The the reasoning I heard out of Cleveland from from owner Dan Gilbert was that he we we all know Dan Gilbert's affinity for Colin Sexton. That's his guy. He right. really feels like this. He he truly kind of feels that he can re, he can give Cleveland another winner after LeBron, and that starts with him for him with Colin Sexton and Ty Lue. I, I don't know if it was an insistence on playing the older guys or well, Sexton only started once. He was yeah. or that or he wasn't as keen on Sexton in general. But clearly, there was some discord between Ty Lue and the owner. And anytime that happens, except for Minnesota, obviously, the owner's going to win. And so, yeah. and Ty Lue saw the door. Yeah, Colin, uh, Colin really hasn't seen the floor a ton. He's averaging 24 minutes, started once. I mean, he's just, his numbers are fine for the number of minutes he has. But yeah, I feel like I feel like it's fair to think he's the future of that team right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's certainly not Rodney Hood and Jordan Clarkson. And C, um, C.D. Osmond's okay. C.D. Osmond's um, nice. But, like, that's really the only, like... Build around piece they have. Clearly, can we also talk about the fact that Kevin Love has been out for two weeks and he still leads the Cavs averages in points, rebounds, and assists per game? I mean, yeah, when well, you average 19, 11, and 13 through four games, I think you're going to keep that <laughs> lead on a shitty team. I mean, <laughs> this that, team's not good. I mean, sure, but somebody's got to put up the points on the Cavs. Yeah, but like through four games, he averaged 19. His that number will not change. And for one of those other guys to pass him, they'd need to continue putting up like 20s and 25s to eventually get to 19 points a game. So it makes sense that he's still leading the team in all those categories because he hasn't had the seven other games these guys have had to kind of regress back to what probably would be his mean, which is not averaging a goddamn triple-double. <laughs> <laughs> still pretty cool, though, if, if you ask me. Okay, it's not triple-double. I was reading it incorrectly. It averages three assists per game. It's a but double-double double 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 nonetheless. <laughs> I, was looking, I was looking at points... Rebounds and defensive rebounds. <laughs> ah, gotcha, gotcha. So, I understand rebounds. There's 13 and a half a game. That's tough to do. Yeah. I can even understand points, but three and a half assists a game. You're telling me there's nobody that's, on the Cavs that's bad. that can average more than, that can't get me four assists. Yeah, he shouldn't have been leading their assists per game when he was playing, <laughs> let, alone, let alone when he's not playing. That that is that is bad. I'll give you that. That's not a good sign. Um, I believe He's also not far from leading the team in turnovers per game. So, tisk tisk, Kevin Love. Clean wow. Up, clean wow. up those giveaways. What but, are you uh, doing, Kevin Love? Get back on the court and don't turn the ball over. Leading the Cavaliers in turnovers is C.D. Osman. Yikes. Yikes. So. so, yeah, so not a whole lot to love there in the Cavaliers organization. Awful. They have finally signed Larry Drew. Larry Drew was yes. their interim coach, yep. but was like, no, I need more security after this year, and they gave it to him. So, good for Larry Drew. Go get that money. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, yeah, not a lot to love in Cleveland. Yeah. Now, I think, I, I think it's a good time to jump into some big picture stuff. Some... Just an overarching look at the standings and the teams in the Eastern and Western conferences through 10, 11, 12 games. Sure. You know, I think there's a handful of teams who've really looked good. There's a handful of teams that we thought would look good that have not lived up to that. Um, the one that sticks out to me is Washington. We didn't think they'd be great, but 2-8 and eight is pretty darn bad. No, 2-8. Right. Um, but I think, I mean, we saw the Bucks start, what, 7-0? or no? um, they, they haven't won since beating Toronto, and the Raptors are now 11-1. and one. So I think those two teams have kind of positioned themselves atop the East right now. Um, who have you learned most about in that top four in the East so far? The Sixers kind of struggling, the Celtics doing fine, the Bucks starting off hot, or the Raptors being the leader? I think I'm, I learned the most about the Raptors, but not okay. less because of their start and more because of what they did without Kawhi Leonard. Yes. Like, uh-huh. they looked equally as dominant when yep. Kawhi wasn't in the lineup, and that was huge for, for their entire team culture. I think there were serious concerns about their lack of depth and whether... And not lack of depth in terms of players, but in terms of production. Whether yeah, there were some intriguing pieces, but I think a lot of the or a lot of Toronto's success kind of hinged on all of those pieces hitting, which we know is unrealistic. Right, of course. But in Kawhi's absence, a lot of those more minor pieces got major production, got major minutes, and they showed out. They they played at a level that kind of everyone hoped they would, but no one really expected. And that's really mm-hmm. exciting for this entire Raptors yeah. team. I have a question for. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, I, no, no. I that have was a question it. for you. The Raptors' only loss is by 15 at Milwaukee without Kawhi. Are they undefeated if he doesn't miss those games? I mean, there's a serious, there's a serious chance. And they, yeah, they have the best. Yeah. Re- they already have the best record in the NBA. Yeah. How? What? We all were very Raptors high. better on. than the Warriors confirmed. <laughs> we all were very high on Boston entering this season, and for good reason. And I don't think that needs to change yet. Even though they are six and four, they've still, you know, they're still the team we, we. I think they still can be the team we expect them to be. Toronto, though. What I feel like I mean we've always been sleeping on them. I mean as a as a as a basketball community. Sure. Um, in terms of expecting them to be real contenders. Yeah. 
I mean, it's 12 games, but coming off a season where they led the Eastern Conference and had one of the best records. Was it the best record in the NBA? It's up no. there. It was up there. Um, and, you know, they, they were very good last year in the regular season. They're 11-1 and one now with Kawhi. Um, arguably look better than they did last year. How legitimate are their Eastern Conference title hopes now compared to the beginning of the season? Very legitimate. Very legitimate. Um, I what do you mean percent odds on them winning the East? Like, like thirty something, forty something. I think it's pretty. I think if we're if we're if we're doing odds, Celtics are probably a little bit below fifty percent, somewhere around forty ish. But uh, Raps are are high thirties, low forties, and the Bucks have, have some shot in there. I think those are all. And the Sixers probably have have some claim yeah, at that, yeah, but a little bit. Yeah. Um, they but still I, need to they still need to prove some stuff to us. Definitely, oh, yeah. undoubted. Uh, but I I personally am kind of mad at myself for not seeing. I was really high on the Raptors. I loved their depth. I loved their real ten man rotation. Yeah. I think oh that, no, you were saying that in the preseason for sure. And I'm kind of mad at myself that I didn't I didn't make pick them. Yeah, really, really, really pick them to to win the East because when you when you break it down in simplest forms. This was the best team in the East last year, and they replaced DeMar DeRozan right. with Kawhi Leonard. All right, here's like, what we're going to do. put it that way. We're going to – and it's now <laughs> uh, mid-October. Jacob, uh, it's almost NBA season. Who's winning the East? Well, Jeff, I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's the Toronto Raptors. Whoa. Yes. Are I'm you th- sure? But Boston's got Tatum, Ben. Boston's and good. And Gordon Hayward and Kyrie. Scary Terry. <laughs> Bo- Jacob. Boston is incredibly talented, and I love their depth, but I am super worried that they just have too many guys. Like, sure. at some point... Trade Terry, a guard, right? Terry, somebody <laughs> has to go. Like I, uh, The Suns were interested in Terry Rozier, which is a great move for them. That'd be a fantastic move for them. I'm curious what the asking price is, because it's, sure. so, it's so clear that Terry Rozier needs a trade that like mm-hmm. that's brought down his value substantially, I think. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious what teams are willing to give up for a player of that caliber. Yeah. But if they're able to, if they're able to, to snatch a first round pick for Terry Rozier, they got to do it. Give me an ideal move for a team that needs a point guard that would that would make sense for the Celtics that would get them Terry gets that that get said team Terry Rozier. So I proposed this I think on the last pod, but I, I'm not sure how realistic it is. But I really do think this helps both teams. A clean swap. Of was Ter- it was it the Hornets? No, it was the Magic. I Mad, was you're right. You're Terry right, Rozier yeah. to the Magic in exchange in exchange for Nikola Vukovic. Yes, you're I think, right. I think Rozier. Rozier instantly slots in as a Magic starting point guard, considering they're starting DJ Augustine right now. So, <laughs> so you know, Terry Rozier <laughs> is a is a slight upgrade. And then Vucevic, I I personally am a huge. He's Vucevic been good this fan. year. He's been re- he's been really good for the past like three four years. Yeah, yeah. Vuce. Defensively, he has his shortcomings, and we everyone knows about that. You know that coming in. But if you are living, if you are okay with that, mm-hmm. he provides such value on the offensive side of the ball, yeah. especially on the offensive glass. He's consistently. And he'd be backing of, up Horford, right? He'd be backing up Horford. He kind of take those Baines minutes, which I, right. depending on your opinion of Baines, that's either a slight upgrade or a substantial upgrade. But it's an upgrade nonetheless. In, I think everyone would agree that's an upgrade nonetheless. So yeah, I, I that to me makes a lot of sense if the Celtics are just looking to get an asset back for this year. If they want to go. Further down the line, I'd try to trade for like the Phoenix like 2022 first or something like that, or sure. just kind of banking on Phoenix staying bad. But um, but I, I I think there are there are definitely trades out there for the Celtics. I'm just curious how aggressive they're going to be, especially when everyone knows that they're trying to trade Terry. Yeah, I mean the the back back to the Raptors though they've beaten pretty much all the top teams in the East except for Milwaukee when they didn't have Kawhi. Um, so I think to wrap up that Eastern Conference conversation we've been having. Um, while the Boston, while Boston is still an interesting storyline, Toronto, Toronto's, Toronto's really, the real deal. They've impressed me more than anybody so far, based on like what I expected them to be. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I knew they'd be good. I didn't think eleven and one through twelve games. Yeah, yeah. I also didn't think the Bucks would start seven and zero. No, no. Bucks have been equally impressive. Um, I think. I don't want to say more of their success has come to scheduling, but. A huge part of their early season rise up the rankings has come to a relatively easy schedule. I think they yes, they, that they is played true. Some of the lower quality competition in the East, but with that being said, that's just kind of the reality of the East is that you're going to get a fair amount of games. Although, up. let's talk about this based on ESPN's strength of record metrics. Milwaukee's number one. Really? Yes. Interesting. That's probably though because they've played teams who, while you said are in the top half of the East, have good records. That makes As opposed to some of the teams we know are better that have maybe middling records. And that and, and so you have a, a list pulled up for us. Is that currently is that of of the games already played or is I that going so. forward? Yeah, okay, I believe cool. it's to this point in the Interesting. season. Interesting. It, it's kinda like an RPI. It's sure. who you've beaten and who they've beaten. Sure. Um exactly. and so the rankings for that go Milwaukee, Toronto, Boston, Golden State, Denver, Portland, Sacramento. 
Yeah. At six and five. Wow. Philly Clippers Pelicans. Yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. Pelicans the only team in that top ten that are sub five hundred right now. That is five interesting. That's kind of wild mm-hmm. for the for the strength of record to yeah. so strongly correlate with also also wins. Yeah, but uh, based on sheer difficulty of schedule, some interesting cases. New Orleans is scheduled at five and six is fourth hardest to the in, to date um, in in the NBA. Um, Milwaukee's is second. Boston's is first. Now two two and eight teams slot into the top five in schedule difficulty so far. Phoenix, who we know is bad, and Washington, who we thought would be okay. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, people were much higher on Washington coming into this year than I think maybe they had in past years. You know, they'd made some uh, some interesting, some intriguing offseason mm-hmm. acquisitions. They've always had that quote unquote, you know, great backcourt. Yeah, they, they yeah. still have Wall and Beal. That's still going to mm-hmm. put them at a level of competency. They, I feel like they've been playing together for fifteen years. It so. really <laughs> does feel like. It. Yeah, I mean, they got Dwight Howard, they got Austin Rivers, yeah. they got something, and just it's been a it's been a it's been a train wreck. Yeah, I mean they. Like we've said, like we, we clearly they've played some good teams, but like two and eight is two and eight. Exactly. What are you? I mean, what's your what's your thinking going forward if you're the Wizards? Like, are you were like, okay, this is just a flash in the pan, and we're gonna figure it out, or are you worried? I'm blowing it up. If I'm the if I'm the Wizards, I'm blowing it up for sure. I'm they sure. have proven to us that they can't win with this core. Exactly. I mean, they got Some, the eight seed last year. Something's got to go. Yeah, yeah. Something's got to go. Wall they finished and Beal. below last year's Heat. Wall and Beal clearly can't play together. This is a pairing that we've seen time and time again that makes so mm-hmm. much sense on paper, but Ugh. just doesn't in reality. And so it's it's yeah. it's got to go. They're they're so bad defensively right they're now. They're getting blasted too by twenty three to Oklahoma City, nineteen to Dallas, by thirty two to the Clippers. They're horrible. They're, <sighs> they're, they're, they're very very. Their bad. only wins are by one in overtime at Portland and by thirteen at home against the Knicks. Yeah, this is a this is a rough showing for Washington. Scott yeah. Brooks, it's probably time for him to see the door. Um, it, they need to be really bad this year. I think that I think a lot of East teams are saying that, but mm-hmm. but the Wizards have a a serious shot at being yeah. super bad and trying to nab the top five pick. Yeah, absolutely. And then lastly, a couple more interesting storylines in the Eastern Conference and I mean the NBA in general. Um, we can't remember if we talked about this on our last pod or not, but we're going to because he's been killing it. Zach Levine is a top five scorer in the NBA with 27.8 points a game. He's killing it. He's probably the best piece for the Bulls, which included Jabari Parker, who's absolute ass. Um, did you see the video on Twitter of him playing defense? Yeah, him, so he's like... Just literally standing somebody's there. Somebody's coming down the other side of the lane, and he's just parked on his block. And yeah, he's and like, he's yep. like moving his feet. He's like moving his feet back and forth. I, not I'm going good, to, yeah. That's I, incredible. Yeah, he's. I mean, that's that's nothing new though from Jabari. I know, like, but that's like yikes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I if they if, if the Bulls were seriously worried about that, they shouldn't. Have, like that, yeah, that's 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 true. part of the package with Jabari. Right. You know what you're getting into. You're getting into a an offensive minded guy who's gonna who's gonna jack up his shots and gonna take some time off on defense. Mm. Defense is not his bread and butter. It's not where he finds his skills are best used. And and uh, we have yet to see that correlate with winning. But mm. uh, but. Props to you, Jabari. If you feel like if if that's how you get your money, good for you. But like clearly, that's going to hold your team back right. from from actual championship aspirations. Right now, let's have some happy discussion though about the Bulls though, because let's get back to Zach Levine. Yeah, Zach Levine's He's been, been great. so freaking good. He has oh. been fantastic. Whenever he is, he is their main. Are you building around him at this point? Uh, I mean, I don't think they're going to stop doing anything they're doing to like I like I don't think this this emergence of Zach Levine changes anything for sure, them. Sure, but uh, but I think it's a, a really welcome surprise for somebody who like, right. was whose potential was seriously up in the air. I yeah. mean, I mean, people dogged on that Jimmy Butler trade at the time. That was just like one of the most hated trades in recent NBA history. And in, in, in like eighteen months, that is turned seems like it's really paying off for the Bulls. Lori Lori Markkinen is really good. He is solid. Zach Levine, something clearly. Chris Dunn, who knows? But again, that could be something. Like, yeah, there there are real pieces that they there are real pieces on this Bulls team. That's part of the reason I picked them for the playoffs this year. Yeah. I think guys think won that trade. At this point, at this point, it has to be the Bulls. Yeah, yeah exactly. especially what you're seeing Jimmy Butler's doing in, in Minnesota now. Like you're talking about Jimmy Butler, who is while definitely a better player than Zach Levine and Laurie Markkinen, has brought Minnesota barely an eight seed, and now a whole lot of drama. And I'm not saying the drama's his fault. But that's what he's been for them. He's been almost he's been almost pissing the playoffs, and now a whole lot of drama. Okay, uh, when that trade first happened, was were your guys' first reactions like, "Wow, what a steal for Minnesota"? Or were you like, "Okay, that's a fair trade"? I definitely thought the Timberwolves won the trade. I thought it was a steal. I, I genuinely thought for like, Minnesota. Yeah, I thought yeah, yeah. Minnesota fleeced them. I thought mm-hmm. you know they're getting the top. 15 it was hard not to because yeah. no one can foresee this from Zach Levine. Exactly. Exactly. Let alone Larry Marketing. 
I don't know. I think we could we could have seen. Okay, they have the potential to have something out of that pick, and Zach Levine has the potential to be a six. I didn't see him being a starter like this, but I could see him being a sixth man. And then if you get a star for um, from that pick from Laurie Markkinen, and if Chris Dunn also becomes like a serviceable bench player, I don't think it's a bad trade for the Bulls. Well, I, yeah, sure, but yeah, bad, bad trade and not winning the trade are two different stories. And yeah. um, I think at the time, Jimmy Butler still is, was then, one of the best players in the NBA. And they gave him up for what looked like, on paper, not that much. Well, it was also just a bunch of question marks. Like you just said. Exactly. There were, there like, were like it was five... Everything you just described was potential. Yeah. So, sure. like, so, and, like, and, and so much of that is hit. Like, the, the Bulls are, Bulls are quote-unquote winners of this trade because these things have hit to a certain extent. Check his potential. <laughs> um, Zach Levine, yes, yeah, super talented. This is the best case scenario a plus for, what potential. The, for what the Bulls could have hoped from that trade. And so, yeah, so at the time, definitely dogged on them for this. But uh, right. but this is this has gone about as well as the Bulls could have hoped. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And you you said it, you said it yourself. They're probably a playoff contender in a, in a, in a wide open. Exactly, the East is so East. bad. The East is is just a is just a crapshoot to a certain extent. Like I think it's just going to be. Who gets randomly hot in February, yeah. you know? And so I definitely think this could be this Bulls team. Yep, for with, sure. With so much left to prove. Um, I'm still waiting to see a little more from Wendell Carter. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. I really liked him coming into the year. I thought he was super talented, super, just a great fit for the modern NBA. And I don't want to say he's done poorly, but it's just some of the things, I mostly defensively, where I thought he would be, uh, where I thought he would be above the curve, where I thought he would be ahead of schedule, he's maybe at schedule or a little behind. Right. But Coach K bought his mom lunch, and that's bad. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so Wendell Carter, not a good guy, obviously. Exactly. Obviously. Breaking but. laws. <laughs> but. Uh, but, yeah, so Wendell Carter, I think I really like the Bulls' core. I really enjoy what they have going forward. And once they get Laurie back, the pairing of Wendell Carter and Laurie down low. And and as, as my, that, would, that would mean sending Jabari to the bench, which I don't think they're probably going to do. But yeah. my, my favorite pairing for their, for their front court – it's Carter and Mark. Sure. Now, other rookies that have stuck out. Trey Young's been great, but he's playing on a terrible Atlanta team. Sure. But he's but averaging eighteen and eight, and his 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 eight assists are top five in the league. Yeah. And that's impressive. Is he? I mean, I think when we entered this season, we talked a lot about. Luke, I mean, Luka Doncic has also had great numbers. Yeah. So that's about him. Uh, we talked about Marvin Bagley, and he's been solid. But Trey Young, I feel like, was somebody we weren't really talking about as like one of the best rookies. Like you know, he'd be good. But we didn't put him in Luka Doncic's class. No, no, no. And one he's was. there. I mean, Luka Luka's averaging twenty six and four. That's twenty comma six and four, um, not twenty six points. But um, he's quietly been as advertised. I think that's a good way to describe him. But those, those two, when I'm looking at just raw stats, have really been the most impressive through, you know, start of season two now, as a whole. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think what we're seeing from Trey is that your early race for rookie of the year. Definitely. I think mean, yeah. th- those have to be the contenders. I think. I think Marvin Bagley, like you said, had something to say about sure. that. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. There's probably some players that were that were forgetting, but of the right. of the pedigree of the top five picks, he's all. I mean, all of the top five picks have looked solid. I mean, yeah. uh-huh. probably the worst is Jaron Jackson. He's looked still pretty. Yeah, he's fine averaged what, like Memphis. twelve and five or something, something mm-hmm. along those lines. But Trey Young averaging eighteen and eight right now, or yeah, eighteen and eight. Which is kind of unheralded for a rookie. Every oh other my goodness, rookie, yeah. Every other rookie who averaged at least eighteen points and at least five assists has one rookie of the year. It's the assists that are that are stunning me. Yeah, exactly. And I, just because he, I, I, I don't want to downgrade that, but it just he has the ball in his hands so sure. much. Sure. But you that. also you also wondered if his passing ability would translate from college to the NBA. Oh, definitely. Because it was, I mean, it, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm idealizing a little bit here, but a lot of what made him such a good passer was those crazy highlight passes, and you wondered, okay, can he pull that off? Night in, night out in the NBA. Not that he's doing that, but his passing ability as a whole has translated to a much harder competition. Yeah, to that's a, impressive. At a much higher degree than I thought it would, if yeah. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I eight assists is eight assists. I did not think he would be this level facilitator from the jump, and it's, it's super impressive. He's yeah. really good. He's only shooting, what is it now, 27% from three, which yeah. is a, a slight bit concerning, taking six and a half per game. So yeah. not, not ideal on that end, but that is something that I think will come with time. We've seen these moments from Trey Young where he really, it really appears to be that transcendent scorer and facilitator yeah. that we rarely see in the NBA. And so, flashes of Steph Curry, not necessarily all Steph Curry, but flashes. I mean, flashes of Steph Curry, but also combined with the facilitator of someone like Chris Paul or one of sure. these elite, you know, sort of game managers. And that's a that is a combination we rarely see. And so right. It, it's it's hard it's hard not to get hyperbolic with a, a rookie of this caliber. But yeah. but yeah, he's played super well. Now, 
if the rookie of the year were handed out relative to expectation, Alonzo Trier is winning it. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> He's been great this year. He's been awesome. I mean, the fact and he that was what a late second undrafted? Undrafted, undrafted. undrafted. That's incredible. Yeah, undrafted. He was long. always good in college, but no one ever talked about him. I mean, he he's was, older. He he was older. He played on a U of A team that I think people like cared about, but not really. I Especially just, when they lost early. When they he lost had no early, chance to show show his stuff in March. He had like, DeAndre Ayton on his team. He had Raleigh Atkins on his team. Like he was kind of Raleigh over. Atkins. Raleigh, what I said? Hawkins. You said Atkins. Oh, did I? Okay, a little 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 difference. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, he was kind of always overshadowed as a Wildcat, and now that he's gotten the ability to really get the ball in his hands for a Knicks team that has nothing to play for, it's awesome. He's really showing off the the kind of off-the-dribble ability that made him such a tantalizing prospect in college. Yeah, just some numbers on him. 11 11 points a game, uh, a couple rebounds, one assist, but, I mean... He's also playing, t- also playing twenty four minutes a game. He started, he started once, um, and he's just been consistently good. You know, he's yes. not putting up incredible numbers, but he's been consistently solid. Um, Trey Burke also been solid for that Knicks team. Yeah, um, which yeah, has yeah. a lot more young pieces than I think we recognize. Not great pieces, but yeah. solid. It's it's hard, I think, not to not to quite overreact to the stats we're seeing in New York because somebody has to score the ball. Yeah, it's like, true. Like, yes, all these numbers are encouraging. Yeah, Tim Hardaway's 24 a game is a little... Exactly, excited. exactly. They're, I mean, he just put up 34, I think, last night. Like, he... There there are just... Somebody has to score. Somebody has... They're, they're still putting up 100, 120 points a game. And so somebody has to put up those numbers. And yeah, um, Jeff, I see you're pulling up our current fantasy team right now. And I just want you to know that Tim Hardaway is currently already owned and, no. is, in, and is in my starting lineup. No. So that was, a, that was a sneaky try on your part, but you're just a little bit too late. He needs to come to Millsap's Fables. <laughs> See, he won't because Millsap's Fables is going to take a fat L to the <laughs> fake Jews this week. The fake Jews. The fake Jews. You Captained man- by a real Jew. <laughs> man to man listeners, you are getting a... a a nice little perspective into the world of fantasy basketball that currently occupies our life. Um, it is an exciting time. I mean, there's a clear best team in the league, the and, that's, and that's the Dancing Lances. Maybe it's the team who, out, who scored own. the most last week, and that would be the... Uh, that What the hell was that? I was eating that W. <laughs> I don't know if, if our listeners remember when Jameis Winston <laughs> ate a W before the game to hype his team up. But that's what I was doing. I was eating okay. that W. For reference here, Jush has his... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint you a word picture. Jush has his fingers in one hand shaped like a W. So you've got the pointer and pinky spread out and then the ring finger, middle finger crossed to make a W. Thumb, thumb is tucked in. And he's... Flinging it back and forth, and he's like, like he's doing that thing with his mouth where he's like flicking it off of his cheek to make that like, like pop sound, like, pop, pop, pop. and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but, well, now you know, Jeff. But now we know. Uh, now we point know. being, channeling my inner James Winston. Point being, uh, but not too much, because <laughs> please stop. Point being, Juice, are you done? <laughs> I'm done. Okay, Juice is done. Point being. My fantasy team is better than yours. Wow. And it outscored both of you last week. A take, a take. Wow. And you lost last week. And wow. An incorrect one, but still wow. a take. Ooh, I don't know, Getting I don't Getting back to the NBA. <laughs> this is the NBA. Stand. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this is the NBA. It's <laughs> our NBA. It's the, it's the, it's the new <laughs> basketball association. Please stop. <laughs> Going back to the real NBA. <laughs> The rookies have been just yes. been phenomenal this yep. year. Yeah, like, this absolutely. Is the I think we rarely see picks that were supposed to do this well actually do this well. Yeah, like, for sure. I mean, DeAndre Ayton ha- is quietly putting up numbers yeah. in Phoenix. Like, and I'm so glad they've all lived up to the hype. He's just a walking double-double every yep. night. And so I, I really love it. Some more unheralded pro- um, prospects coming in that have kind of shined. We already touched on Alonzo Trier. Landry Shamet from your Philadelphia 76ers really looks solid. Yeah. Their guard depth has been... Um, Point of concern, especially with the with Markel Fultz not playing quite up to expectation, but Landry Shamet has been a really exciting surprise. Yep, I really like what we're seeing out of him. And so yeah, there's there's just some pieces around the NBA that have that have quietly been putting up some numbers. Dante Divincenzo in Milwaukee. Yeah, I think there's some there's some really exciting young pieces in the NBA as they currently stand. But the studs have been performing like they have, like like studs, like they right. like top five picks. Absolutely. Um, anything else in the NBA? Uh, let's see. Anything else? Um, Lakers still topsy turvy. Still, 
Wait, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. It's, they just signed Tyson Chandler, which that's is the move. Huge. That, oh, and then you say that sarcastically, but that is, I I think that is going to. We saw they have struggled night. in the in the in the front court. We saw sure. last night Tyson Chandler had two huge offensive rebounds in the final minute of the game that helped seal the victory for the Lakers. They yes, have, we saw that last night. Yes. Yeah. Oh my bad. Okay, I saw that last. Night. Oh, and and yeah, just I mean the fact that. They've now they replaced Jonathan Williams minutes, who is a undrafted free agent, undrafted rookie free agent, with Tyson Chandler is from just Florida Gonzaga. State. Oh, exactly. oh yeah. Um, and we so, did mention him last time. We did, yeah, yeah. Because like right, he you're was, right. you're right. he was a key member of, of the Lakers rotation coming yeah. into yep. a couple just a couple days ago, and now Tyson Chandler is a is back in LA as he he has come full circle. He was a he was a high school prospect here in LA and then came all the way back for his now like eighteenth NBA season. So it's great to have Tyson Chandler in a Lakers uniform and I think that's huge. Yeah. One other final point I I talked about earlier in the podcast, so I'm mad at myself for not seeing this. Another another team that I'm really mad at myself for not seeing the trend is the Jazz. Oh, um, I thought you were gonna say the Nuggets. I think everyone will kind of talk themselves into the Jazz being really good. Being really good and in the off season was was just kind of thinking, okay, they were good at this point last year, and they're only going to get better, and that's yeah. just not the reality of NBA teams. My, I, I've probably said this thousands of times on this podcast, but my one of my favorite ideas about basketball is progression is not linear, and right. and so while yes, the, the Jazz ended last season on a wonderful hot streak, they were they looked dominant, they looked like a defensive stalwart. There's no, there was no expectation that that would carry over to this season. We've mm-hmm. really seen that their defense. And the Sixers were a similar, similar case. Definitely, definitely. Don't forget they went sixteen and zero down the stretch. For sure, but I, I think there were more signs of encouragement sure, there sure. than there were for long term. Just be, with the Jazz, a lot of their production came from these, you know, middling role players like Jay Crowder really stepped up last, yeah. last year. Derek Favors really stepped up. Jay, um, Joe Ingles, like these players that are. Fantastic, but if you're really relying on them to become yeah, a top four seed, do so much exactly. And so, and I think we're seeing now in this in this early season that they may not have that second piece next to Donovan Mitchell to really elevate them to an elite. Not even Western, Rudy. Not even Rudy. Not even Rudy. Go- no, I'm just in terms of offensive firepower. Sure. Like he he's he's not the yeah his, his defense is exactly really, defense yeah. is his calling card. Defense is what makes him valuable. They they are but they need scoring. They're sorely yeah. lacking that that second score and. And I, I, I should have seen this. I'm really mad at myself I didn't. But you know, you're, you're, everyone you're, talked you're, themselves into the Jazz. You're, and your Syracuse comp is really this. The more you talk about the Jazz, is becoming scarily obvious to me. Holy yeah. Poor Utah fans. Yeah, it's rough. It's a, it's a, it's a dismal sight in Utah. Just considering play it's two, Utah. Play 2-3 zone. <laughs> get a lot of snow. You know, have people make fun of you for being cold and then hire a really, really good coach. And I mean, Quinn Schneider's awesome. So, yeah, they, they already got that part down. You know, Barely get into the playoffs and go to the conference finals, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Josh, are you going to say something? Oh, I was going to say, uh, I feel like a wing could have really helped them. Maybe, like, um, somebody they had a few years back, the name is escaping me. He left him free agency. Um, just say his name. Oh. Gordon Hayward. Oh, Gordon okay. Hayward probably could have helped them. But, like, yes. honestly, he probably could have helped them with right now. I mean, yeah. Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, they wanted him back. Like, it was not like yeah. they they kicked him to the curb, but they really wanted him back. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, they they are lacking in that second score. They're lacking in in true impact depth players, and yep. so that's that's going to be their Achilles heel going forward. Yep. Well, I think that does it for the NBA. Shall we uh, transition over to the, the two days old college basketball? <laughs> I think season? it's time. I think it's time. Um, real quick, I think we're gonna have to start doing this a little more often on the college basketball portion of the podcast. A moment of silence for those who suffered John Rothstein's epitome of, epitome of brutality. In losing a bye game. So real quick. So uh, explain to the listeners oh, yes. what a okay. bye game is. A bye game, game is. Is, a non, is a game that's scheduled and is not a home and home, which means the visiting team is being paid to come play the home team. And so when you lose, John Rothstein refers to it as the epitome of brutality because you paid to lose. And it's, you probably it's, paid multiple tens of thousands of dollars, or if not more. They really did. To um, lose. To lose a game. To a team you probably should have beaten. So the list goes on as... Wichita State lost to Louisiana Tech. We should get like mu- sad music playing. <laughs> we really should. Um, <laughs> of the Baylor know. loses to Texas Southern. George Washington loses to Stony Brook. Wyoming loses to UCSB. And I think the big one that we did not think really looked like a bye game, St. Bonaventure loses to Bucknell. Yeah. Um, those two teams. That doesn't feel like an upset to me. I told you that does not yeah, feel like yeah, an upset. Yeah. But real quick, just a moment of silence for these five teams. Moment of silence. All right, Good so Champions Classic, um, speaking of farting, Kentucky 
Oof, that was. But the st- real story is Duke looking incredible. Yeah, but exactly. We'll get to Kentucky, and I think it looks terrible. On top of Duke looking really good, but let's talk about Duke first. It's the obvious story so far is how incredible Duke looked and really shut up the people who said, "Oh, the freshmen can't play together. Oh, they're too young." And it's one game, but holy cow, that was a show. Yeah, that was kind of ridiculous. I mean, uh, last year Marvin Bagley set the Duke freshman debut record, like the debut game scoring record with like 25 points. Two guys broke it last night <laughs> or Tuesday night. RJ had what? 33 and Zion had 28 and Cam had 22 and there's like 90 of your 118 points in your 118 to 84 win. We were Jacob and I were covering Arizona State's game against Cal State Fullerton, also a scary game for that team. <laughs> um, and we, uh, I pulled up a tweet on my on, on, on my Twitter feed from I think it was Jeff Goodman. I hadn't been following too heavily on this game, and it says Kentucky just pulled it, just pulled within 33. Oh, and I'm like, what? And I showed it to Jacob and I showed it to our friend Jordan, and we were just stunned. Yeah. Because and this wasn't even close in the beginning. It was like 29 no, to 10 exactly, exactly. before you could even blink. Duke, Duke showed from the jump that they are just going to be more talented than every other team yeah. they play this year. I mean, Trey Jones was the 10th best player in this class, and all he had to do was put up 6, 7, and 4 to win by 30. Yeah. I mean, Javin DeLaurier was supposed to be like a, a like sneaky good piece for this he Duke team. Not and he did not score. And he didn't even need to do anything. <laughs> like, that's, like, like, yeah, you could look at this like, yeah, he didn't score, but like you could also say, oh, he didn't need it's, to that's score. That's my point. They had these that's so my point. much ridiculous talent. Yes, Trey that- Jones, Jack White, and Javin DeLaurier combined – for 15 points and 10 and 10 and those assists. are all those are all probably top 20 yes. 30 prospects yes I, all great players exactly. that would players that would make any other college team better that would start on functionally yes. any other college and they team. had to do nothing for duke to win by 32 <laughs> point 34 points over the number two way overrated team in the country yeah i think that I think kentucky that tells bad. us a lot more I this think. is calipari's worst loss yeah, yeah and i think when when you lose by 34 as a top five team no matter how good Duke looked, a lot of it has to reflect on Kentucky. They could not hammer down a lineup. Sure, they sure. could not find a functional lineup against you know the best team they'll play all year. You know their schedule will only get easier from here. I mean it has to. Yeah. Um, they're playing the SEC. There's no Duke in the SEC. But don't, don't hate uh, on Tennessee like that. <laughs> um, I'm farting a lot. Yeah, you podcast. are really. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Reed Travis looked good. Keldon Johnson looked really good. Yeah. I did not expect him to be that good. But PJ. Struggle. P.J. Washington struggled. Emmanuel Quickly was nothing to me. E.J. Mon- All these guys we thought would be great freshmen. E.J. Montgomery, Emmanuel Quickly, P.J. Washington did nothing. Quade Green, one point. Yeah, like yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, no, not exciting at all from him. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. P.J. Washington is a sophomore. You're right. I'm sorry. I, I was okay, I was yeah, referring yeah. to quickly in each okay, of them. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing about this Kentucky team is that they all this, feel like freshmen. This isn't a typical Kentucky team yeah. in that they have Reed Travis, a graduate transfer. Yep. P.J. Washington is a soft <clears throat> sophomore. Quade Green is a sophomore. Like this is a slightly older yeah. Kentucky team, and you would think with a little more competency. And then they go out and lose by by yeah. thirty something, twenty but something. The, pro- in there, in the there. problem there is every other year Calipari builds teams with freshmen and knows who he's starting. Sure. The only the only question last year, as far as who was going to see the most of the floor, was Quade Green versus Shea Gilgis Alexander. Yeah. And now. And that wasn't even a that wasn't even a debate at the beginning of the year. I mean, Quade Green was, was a Quade, consensus yeah. five star prospect. Shea Gilgis Alexander was his four star kind of middling. He was the worst prospect of the Kentucky class. Yeah. And so you're right at the beginning of, at this point last year. Kentucky had a solid they starting knew what their five. Was, yep. They knew what their identity was. They had they had a look. But this is the perfect team for Duke to go up against in their in their opening Absolutely. Season. A team that they, has no idea what they look a like. A team that has no idea what they're looking like. That's gonna that that honestly probably against a lot of players that, that Cam Reddish, Zion and Zion Williamson and, and RJ Barrett have played against. These are all players from this class and it, yeah. it makes it is the perfect entrance for this for the super team that Duke's created. Mm, absolutely. Uh, but I am worried about Kentucky. Oh, you have to be. You have because, to be. like, like I said, they really couldn't figure out a combination. That no. was the biggest thing I noticed watching, you know, portions of that game um, during halftime of our ASU game <laughs> and, and whatnot. Um, was just they did not have a combination. Like they, I mean, they have a lot. They have a first of all, they have a lot of similar players. Exactly, they have um, a lot of overlap in their talent. Yes, um, and and so I worry, you know, who are you gonna have on the floor at the same time? Because you know, I think you need to have Reed Travis out there pretty often. Kelvin um, Johnson. Okay. Kelvin Johnson's for great. Me, for sure, Kelvin Johnson and Reed Travis are, are staples yeah. in their lineup. I After think PJ that. Washington's made a claim. Yeah. Tyler Hero's good. Like that's a that's another five star, but like 
he's mostly just a shooter. He's going to space the floor. So, like, yeah. that's... So they, they have some real questions they need to answer yeah, about I, where this team's looking going forward. I worry about that Kentucky team, and I, I don't worry about Duke. I do think we're going to see Duke, like, cool off. Like, yeah, this, this, this is, is not... a first game against a team that clearly did not know what it was going to look like, clearly had a lot of question marks, and Duke just came out and just warped them. Exactly. This, I this honestly, is not going to be... not that surprised by... I was more surprised by the margin of victory than yes. an actual victory. We all know Duke is going to eventually lose by three in a 50-point game at Virginia at some point this definitely. season. Definitely. They're definitely going to um, go to Boston College and lose yes, there. And that's, off, the, yeah. that's an easy one. To, exactly. Um, they're going to they're gonna go to Syracuse and win by 30. Those, exactly. These are all formalities that we know are going to happen. Precisely. But... This Duke team is incredibly talented. We knew that from the jump. I think there have been serious comparisons to that. I, I'm probably butcher the butcher the year 2013 Kentucky team. When was the 38 0 team? 15. Okay, 15. So then there have been 39. Excuse me. So there have been a, a fair amount of comparisons made to that team. And while I I think the the idea is there, I don't agree with this team is is incredibly talented. This Duke team's awesome, but but I'm not positive they have quite the talent of some of those elite Kentucky teams. It might have been thirty-eight and zero. I'm pretty sure thirty-eight and zero. That's what I. That's what I remember. That's the number I always remember. But because I knew, I know if they won it all, they would have been forty and zero, and they lost after their their last win was the Elite Eight. Exactly. So. Damn it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> screw you, Jeff. Um, but overall, still a very exciting thirty-eight moment. and one. Still a very exciting moment okay. for this for this Duke team that couldn't have had a better start to their season. You're right. Absolutely. But the the other game at this Champions Classic was a was surprisingly exciting after the way it started. Yeah, really. Kansas, I mean, we all agree that I think most people agree Kansas was probably the number one team in the country coming in. And a lot of their pieces looked good. And for like 80% of this game, they looked like the number one team in the country. They were pretty much manhandling a Michigan State team that we all thought was okay. Um, you know, 10 seemed a little high. Um, Diedrich Lawson looked great. Um, yeah. Quentin Grimes, I think, exceeded expectation. Uh, a little bit, maybe. Because we were concerned about him being their point guard, and I think he did very well in that role. Definitely. Um, but... Um, they really blew it late, and they almost lost this game. They really did. This is a three-point game on the last possession, and you get an, uh, I mean, a stop, and you get two free throws, and you win by five. They were up by like double digits. I mean, they had a fourteen-point midway... half lead, halftime lead. Yeah. Like this is this was a clearly dominant performance from start to finish from Kansas, and like save for those last two three minutes, this was this was a shellacking by probably the best team in the country. Yeah, you're right. Um, while we just harped on on Kentucky and their their lack of. Their lack of compatibility, this Kansas team seems incredibly well built. I think Dietrich Lawson and Duco Azubuke is a perfect combination down low. I think those two complement each other very nicely. We like we like you said, we had concerns about Quentin Grimes as a, as a true point guard, but he's still one of the more talented freshmen in the country. Yep. And you put the ball in his hands and, and that's a, a good recipe for success. And so I, I really like what the what the Jayhawks yeah. are doing. And, and no one talked about Devon Dodson. He had 16 No, exactly. Night. So I think I think they're in general. <clears throat> depth is a big thing for them, too. Definitely. They've got a lot. I mean, these guys, Mitch Lightfoot, Marcus, Marcus Garrett, KJ Lawson, these are good players who are getting 10, 15 minutes. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. I think they're, they're, they're going to have a lot. I mean, we already knew they were going to be good. Michigan State is Michigan State. I don't yeah. Know, there's not a ton I can say about them. I, I didn't expect them to be very great this year. I expect them to pre pretty much roll through a pretty weak Big Ten. Um like I said, number ten seemed a little high. Yeah, starting I feel like I feel like weird. three, four seed, five seed range is probably their their range. Um, but Kenny Goins with seventeen, Joshua Langford with eighteen, Cash Winston thirteen and eleven. This is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty vanilla team. In yeah, terms of we know what to expect. We know who's good. I okay, I that's know. the thing. So we know who's good, kind of. But Kenny like, Goins stuck out. Kenny Goins, Goins played out of his mind. Cash Winston, I think, is the, the heart and soul of that team. He's Absolutely. Gonna, he's going to go yeah. as far as they can take them. And while 13 11 is impressive, in a game like this, you probably need a little bit more. Yeah, he had 13 points, her. 11 assists. Kenny Goins, you, you looked him up because you didn't know who he was. No, no, no. He's, no. A, he's averaged three points a year every year before this year. He's just starting He's starting for them now. Um, played 33 minutes and had 17 points and 11 boards. That's great. That is great. <laughs> um, would love to see that kind of production out of Nick Ward. That's yeah. somebody who I feel like. Tom Izzo's been kind of cultivating at Michigan yep, State as maybe absolutely. the next great Michigan State big man, mm -hmm. and and just kind of a dud on his opening night. Nine points, five rebounds, clearly outshined by the superior talent on Kansas, and yeah. and yeah, some serious concern. If, if they were in a better conference, I'd be much more concerned about Michigan State. Yeah, I, I think the Big Ten is pretty down this year, so they're going to be able to get 13, 14 conference wins um, just because they have enough talent to beat like 
most of that conference. Exactly. They're going to they're gonna roll over Minnesota. Yeah, they'll and get picked Iowa. off. They'll lose one to Purdue. They'll lose one to sure. Ohio State. They'll get picked off by like a Penn State or somebody. I think those Michigan games will be exciting. Yes, you're but right. Like besides that, but thirteen and five, fourteen and four seems, seems like a very likely that. record and definitely enough to get you like a four seed. Undoubtedly, mm-hmm. undoubtedly. Um. So yeah. So so that was the main takeaways yeah. from the from the Champions Class yeah. from the cream of the crop. There were on a lot. basketball's opening night, but there are still some yeah. intriguing games. Throughout there, the top, 20 there were a lot of other teams. There were a lot, there was a whole lot of close games with like fifteen minutes to go that ended up being sure, yeah, comfortable just, wins. Virginia was only up by like ten on Towson with like eleven minutes. To yeah. Go. Um, what else? UNC Wofford was close. UNC throughout. was close with Wofford. They won by eleven. They went on the road, so that was good. Citadel um, hung around. Citadel Clemson hung with for a Clemson. Long time. Villanova took a while to get away from Morgan State, but once they started ratcheting it up on defense, I mean, they gave up like 45 first half points to Morgan State. Then they really, you know, pick, figured it out on defense. Um, Here's a game I want to I want to hear you talk about a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. Florida State beating Florida by 21. Without um, Phil Kofer. This was a game I kind of targeted as as one of the better games. Of yeah, one of the sneaky night. better games, exactly. too. Absolutely. One of the sneaky better, maybe, it's, uh, maybe the first, not the first, the... The only ranked team to fall to an unranked team. Like, I, I it was possible. This, yeah. I thought this could, this had upset written all over, it, and Florida State just came out yeah. and dominated. I think when I made I released my bracket two weeks ago, the one one of the biggest two of the biggest questions I've had in my head. I'm thinking to myself like seeing other pundits and kind of thinking more about the team. I've been thinking to myself, damn, am I too low on Florida State? Where did you have them? I think like an eight seed. Interesting. And then I was also asking myself pretty often, damn, am I too high on Florida? <laughs> and I think I was right in asking myself both of those questions. This, The thing about this Florida State team, now I, I will say they were always in my prove-it category. They were always in my category of like, yeah, I know what you have, but you've never done anything with it. So you got this class of seniors. Um, you've got this class of seniors, you know, guys like Chris Kumaji, um, you know, Terrence Mann. Um, Phil Kofor obviously didn't play, but this class that has – like, you know, for four years, been successful kind of at Florida State, has made a couple tournaments, they've been a middling ACC team, they've been good enough to, you know, win 2025 games, or 2022 games. Um, the, but the question, though, was can they take the next step as a class? Can sure. they lead you to 25 wins, be a five seed, be competitive? Because last year, we saw this class get hot in March and win a very easy schedule, a very a win three very easy games in March to make the Elite Eight and get beat by Michigan. You know, they, they, they did not have a lot of challenges no, outside of Xavier. Once they beat Xavier, the road got a lot easier. Um, or I should say, that was really the only challenge in the list of three games. But that was that felt like it could be a, pl- a flash in the pan. Sure. Yeah, that was yeah. my concern with Florida State. But beating Florida by 21? That's, a, that's an impressive victory. To that's very to good. And I, I think they're definitely a sneaky top six, top five ACC team. Interesting. Wow. Um, you think they hang around in, in America's best conference? You think they hang around that that high? Yeah, I think there's a clear top three. Um, and that's UNC, Virginia, and Duke in no particular order. I think Syracuse has kind of established themselves as that fourth team. And then uh, with Chris Clark getting suspended for Virginia Tech, I really think that that fifth team is up for grabs between Virginia Tech, Florida State, and Clemson. Okay, okay, um, I can get behind that. that. But those seven are the clear top tier. Sure. And I think they'll. I mean, they're all ranked right now. That's incredible. Yeah, that seven really teams is. are ranked. That really is. Um, uh, Virginia Tech's not ranked, are they? I thought Virginia Tech was they, like 21, 22. You, you're, you're right. You're right. You're right. So seven teams at top twenty-five. And um, I, think, I mean, I've, and Boston College has something to say about that. Like, I think uh, there there are some intriguing pieces in the ACC. I think well, the ACC is incredibly deep, and we've exactly, talked about that. we've talked it. about that before. Um, but uh, NC State's solid. Miami saw everybody's solid. Exactly. Except exactly. Pittsburgh. <laughs> except Pittsburgh. That brings you just a special type. Of oh, game. it just I see them play games and just. Oh. <laughs> Um, speaking they of the produced, ACC, Pittsburgh but, produced an 11 trillion. We did. This is something that, uh, that I am, I am very, I really want to keep track of this as the season goes on as some incredible trillions. And just, just for the listeners who are unaware, a trillion was a, a term not coined by, um, uh, by current ringer writer, Mark Titus, but a, a one brought to popularity by him. If, for people who don't know his story, he was a, a much heralded walk on at Ohio state who, who was good friends with Greg Oden and Mike Connolly during those that run and anywho a trillion is a when a bench war when a walk on gets in the game 
and only puts up minutes as their stat. Their right. only stat they so they just a bunch of zeros across the stat line. And uh, and yeah, so so he put the, this particular player. I don't remember. I, don't I forget know. his name. Yeah, too. of course, it's Pittsburgh but guy. Pittsburgh guy played eleven, 11 minutes, minutes and did not record a single stat. <laughs> I love that. So props to him. <laughs> eleven trillion. That's impressive. That's difficult. <laughs> That's amazing. And I think. Unless you have other points to make, I think we end that we end the podcast on eleven trillion. Sure, we we. I was gonna give you a couple minutes to talk about Syracuse if you really. Wanted. I wouldn't mind. Okay, let's. I uh, mean, just just to provide some context, the Syracuse currently sixteenth ranked Syracuse Orange dominated their opening season victory over the visiting Eastern Washington. What are Eagles. they? Eagles. The Eastern Washington Eagles, sixty six to thirty four. Um, 34, us, yeah. So currently Syracuse has the best defense in the country. That it does. That um, it does. So which will them. remain the case the rest of the season. Well, obviously. well, it's either them or or Dartmouth who right. won, won their game 114 to 39. 39. Mm. So it's, ah, <laughs> not a, it's not 30. As far as I know, 39 is not less than 34. That is a good point. So I'm gonna check. You know what, Jeff? I'm gonna check you on that fact. I'll get back to you next week. Thank you. I appreciate. So that. we're we're gonna we're gonna give Jeff a couple minutes yeah. to talk about Syracuse and then wrap it up. So if if you are a sane person, you'll cut the podcast off. Thanks now. for listening to Man to Man podcast. <laughs> Beep. Okay, so Syracuse. Um, the the thirty four was incredible. It was twenty eight ten at half. <laughs> incredible. O'Shea Brissett looked really good. Um, but this incredible quote, though, I have to read. Bayheim at halftime told Matt Park of Syracuse Radio, "This is worse offense than we played last year." For context, that team was awful on offense last year. We can't make shots. We're not getting good movement. We're not rebounding at all. This is where it gets good. I don't even think our defense is that good. It's just that they're missing shots because they flew 3,000 miles. Awful offense, though. <laughs> so, 66-34, I mean, there's not much else I can say. I mean, I think it's it was a lot of fun to see Buddy Bayheim in a Syracuse uniform sure, sure. and see him put up some points after starting over like, seven. Um, Jalen Carey finally played, and he... He's drawn some early comparisons to some Terry Rozier-esque basketball. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So I'll get back to you with more on that the more I get to watch him. Um, but I've always been high on Jalen Carey. I've always wanted to see him. They, they, the big thing, the big, big, big thing to me here is they won by 32 and they held their opponent to 34 points without their starting point guard. Yeah, that is and really he's impressive. and Frank Howard, their starting point guard, is really only their tr- only. He's really their only viable slash true point guard. Sure. Because Jalen Carey can play the point, but he's a combo guard. He's yeah. you know, He's got skills that make him also more of an off-ball guard. Um, so without Frank Howard to do that, um, and also have Jalen Carey play so many minutes, having never played the zone before, and have the defense show up like that, pretty impressive It's a good sign. Yeah. Really um, and so stuff. they get Moorhead State tomorrow. <clears throat> That's a comfortable victory, I'm assuming. And the next week, it's UConn and hopefully Oregon. So In, in Madison Square Garden. In Madison Square Garden. Should be a real Syracuse, UConn. UConn at the Garden. I don't care how bad UConn is. Syracuse, UConn at the Garden is always a blast. It's iconic. It's, it's iconic. always a blast. I was there last year for two terrible teams, <laughs> and it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm excited to see that one. But yeah, it looked good, Jacob. So thank yeah. you for giving me that minute. I, I you won. got your you got your Lakers minute. So I, I did. I, I, it's I totally it. fair. It's totally fair. Yeah. Um, and so on that note, I think this is the true end to man to man. Yep. Have a we will be back next week. We may soon switch to two podcasts a week. We may just have too much content to talk about. Mm-hmm. So. So expect that in the coming weeks. But we until- definitely could have gone another hour. <coughs> oh, on really yeah. unfolded. Exactly, everything. exactly. If we really wanted to, but uh, we'll pump the brakes for now. We'll 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 give the listeners a little break. Maybe we give it till spring semester. Eh, maybe, maybe we might, we might not we make it that war- long. We will warn you. In four weeks, we will be having to stop the podcast. Uh, three weeks, because we I will be going home for the winter break, and Jacob will be soon soon following me and Juice as well. So, but you know what you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to listen to find out. Exactly. You're going to have to listen. We're coming back to your ears next week. But until then, have a good one.